Uh, Nauset Regional High School building <coughs> project update. Tom Conrad, welcome, Tom. Good Hi, to Amy, see how you. are you? Good to Great. see you. And thank you for being here and, uh, and, and taking part in this uh, discussion as we move forward relative to understanding the project uh, that we're working on at uh, Nauset Regional High School and uh, giving you an update uh, at some point uh, towards the end of the program in terms of where we're at today. Okay? So we're going to, uh, and, and, and quite honestly, uh, I think this is probably the 13th or 14th time we've presented to either a FinCom or a Board of Selectmen. And we're seeing some common themes in terms of questions that they're asking as well. So we have uh, always been adjusting our presentation to try to reflect the concerns that I think probably are going to be the same here tonight as well. Okay? So Chris is going to start it off for us. Chris easily is the chairman of our school committee. And uh, understanding uh, from day one, uh, and we'll move along. We know the time is of essence, but, uh, and then uh, we'll just keep moving through it. So Chris, go ahead. Okay. We'll try to be thorough. Great. But <clears throat> relatively quick. So uh, I'm Chris Easley. I live in Wellfleet. I have two students currently in the school. They're in the high school, first year. Um, so I have a, kind of a vested interest. Actually, when, they'll be out when the school gets remodeled, but thus is life. Um, but they have had a great educational experience, <clears throat> and they've been educated only in these towns. So it's, uh, it's been a good thing. Uh, one of the issues that came up is, why are we doing this? How did this begin? How did we get here? So uh, just to give a history of the project, um, it essentially began back in 2012 when the school, the region, took a look at its buildings, at its structures, and wanted to come up with a maintenance plan to try to get the best longevity out of them as possible. We hired a company, um, uh, Habib Associates, and they did a schematic of each of the buildings and determined what the needs were in each of those buildings, essentially repair and maintenance issues to help uh, them last. Um, so that, we got the report in October of 2012. It became known as the Habib Report. It was actually handed out to all the towns. There's been copies of it and it's been handed out over the years since then. Um, some of the key takeaways from that report was that uh, first off it showed a $21.5 million repair and maintenance issues were going to come due within the next 10 years in the buildings. For the high school that would have been roughly 10, not roughly, would have been in the ballpark of $10 million over the next 10 years. So this was taken on by the Capital Assets Subcommittee, uh, which is just a, an offshoot of the um, school committee. And we looked at the problem and just figured out, how do we address this? How do we, how do we go at this issue? Um, so one of the options would have been to ask the towns for an override, um, but it would have been successive overrides for a, a kind of an ongoing period of time. And in turn, all the costs would have been borne by the towns. Um, when you looked at what was listed, what was going to be repaired, it would have been just an upgrade to mechanical items. Um, in the building, the, the building itself, the high school building, after 47 years of use, is a little tired. It's got some other needs besides just new heating and air conditioning systems. And this wouldn't address any of those issues. It would really just take care of the mechanicals and keep the place running. Um, so, Looking at solutions, we actually, at that point in time, did talk to the towns. Uh, Habib was in some of our advisory at that point and mentioned this MSBA program, uh, Massachusetts School Building Authority. Um, and it seemed like a great idea. We could get somebody else involved that would help pay some of the costs for remodeling our school. So at that point in time, we got together with the towns, asked them if they thought we should apply to this program to have the high school remodeled. And it was unanimous that we should, for, mainly for the cost sharing aspect of it, I believe. In that cost sharing aspect, the MSBA can pay up to 41% of allowable costs. So it's, it's a pretty good deal. Um, the other things that the MSBA brings to the process is that this is what they do. They, the program is very professional. That's what the MSB does is they do 15 to 17 schools each year, either new or remodeled. Um, and so they have a program to see to it that it works. So being involved in it, you get some confidence in the process that you're going through. And they're very detailed as far as, you know, the steps you've got to take and what you have to do. 
The other benefit to it was is that at the end of this process, we would have a school that was completely renovated rather than one that had systems that were working but still had that old, tired look to it. So you, the bang for the buck conceptually uh, would be greatly improved by it. So with um, town's approval, with we applied for the MSBA SOI, which is a statement of interest, statement to be involved in this program to get the high school remodeled. We were not turned down the first year. We weren't accepted or asked to, to uh, participate the first year. In 2016, we reapplied. In February of 2017, we were accepted into the building program. The first step in that building program is the feasibility study, which kind of lays out your challenges and issues in the school. It's one of the steps that is required by um, the MSBA. We, in turn, there is a, a cost involved with that, a million three is what we budgeted for it. We went to the towns at that point asking them. Uh, we got all four towns supported, all four towns in the um, district supported it. A building committee was formed in July of 2017. In February of 2018, the feasibility study was complete. In July of 2018, we took on an OPM, so it's the project manager that works for the region to see to it that the project comes out correctly, that, we're, we're, that our interests are covered throughout this process. In 2018, I'm sorry, pardon me, October of 2018, we uh, chose an architect, Flansburg Associate, uh, I'm sorry, Daedalus is our OPM, very good people. We've actually toured some of their schools uh, that they have done, worked on in the past, and they're amazing, uh, just beautiful, uh, beautiful buildings. October of 2018, through a process, we chose um, the architect for the job, which is Flansburg Associates. Again, I mean, you can go to the website. They've got done some amazing properties, amazing schools. In 20, so from this point in time, from um, November of 2018 through this May of this year, we looked at different prototypes for the school. Went through all different types. We'll get into more of that later. Um, in May of 2019, an educational plan was submitted to it so that the building matches the educational plan of the school. Um, so they both work in unison. And in August of this year, we were accepted in our project into the schematic design. So essentially, we have a plan of the, what the school is going to look like, and the sch schematic design portion is where you put the, th the pieces in place in the design of the building. And that's where we sit right now. Any quick questions? So I'm now going to try to go into two or three areas that uh, seem to come up a great deal in terms of conversations with a variety of boards. The first piece, uh, oh, excuse me. Just aim it toward your, there you go. What's that? Just name? so we can hear you if it okay. has to be pointed at you. That's right. So the first one that comes up is the configuration of the high school. And, uh, and, and that was one of the first pieces that the school committee was charged to do. And uh, they took four months, I'll never forget it. It was a long process in terms of looking at all the possibilities. I can tell you in terms of the configuration, there were two options looked at relative to um, the declining enrollments at the elementary school. Would we see um, some type of movement similar to the sixth graders going back to the elementary schools? Uh, that was a question that they, they, they spent a great deal of time looking at. And then ultimately, the discussion of eighth graders, would they be included in the possible uh, new high school? Now, I'll tell you this much. We are the only uh, public high school that is 9 through 12 on the Cape. And that's probably surprising to some people. That means that in some cases, uh, most cases, eighth graders have moved up into a high school setting. And in one situation, seventh and eighth have now moved up into the high school. Okay? But when it was all said and done, before this project could go any further, the board, board had to sign off on the configuration question, and that ended up being 9 through 12 in a, in a, in a typical high school setting, and 6, 8 in the middle school. Okay? So the board spent a great day, deal of time uh, trying to figure that out. Excuse the, me, the, can I just ask oh, a question? Sure. Were, were there some of the 8th grades moved in 
because of the reduction of number of students in particular? In, in some of those other districts? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. So the other piece was with the MSBA, the question was, what are they going to certify as the, the size of this facility and i.e., what would be the number of students they were recognizing for that project? They have two full-time demographic specialists. I can provide you, if it's of any help to either board, their packet of information that they shared with us in terms of their research on the demographics. But they eventually came down to certifying that this project will be for 905 students. And we can get into that deeper probably in terms of the project itself, but it has to do with, of course, the funding. What they'll fund and what they won't, but it's all related and locked in as a 905 uh, high school going forward, okay, for the MA, MSBA uh, purposes. The next issue I want to touch upon that absolutely is coming up in every community is school choice, okay? And so school choice, I, I, we could spend an hour just on this subject and still have questions, and I'm going to go, I'm going to go quickly but I assume that I'm going to be back in front of this board numerous times before we even think about going to the voters to make sure we're clear on all these issues. School choice is a decision that every school at every level must decide if, it want, if, if you want to participate in this on a yearly basis. In this case, what we see is that typically the Cape Cod is heavily involved in school choice. Western Mass is heavily involved in, in school choice, and the 128 belt and other areas are not participating in choice, okay? So why that's significant is because you're going at some point to ask about what, what are we receiving from funding from school choice? And I just finished this afternoon talking with a, a FinCom member from Orleans, and I was telling him I came here 26 years ago, 20 plus years as the high school principal, and the first year that we stepped into school choice, just a couple of years in my tenure, when we entered into school choice, and the first year we entered into school choice was four students, one in the ninth, 10th, and 11th, and 12th grades, and we were getting $5,000 for those students to come in. Their district had to pay us $5,000. 20 some odd years later, the cost for these communities to send their students in the choice program is still at $5,000. <laughs> and that is a hard, it, it is, it, it's almost inconceivable. How could that still be the case? I think we have an excellent uh, delegation of, 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 of our representatives and our senator. And I have raised this question more times than they want to hear. When I begin down on this path, they put their hand up and stop, Tom. Don't, that's enough. The reason is that the rest of the state has, has no concern about that $5,000 fee for the Cape and the Western Mass states. And so there's they not should enough. have no problem passing it then. <laughs> they have no right? problem passing it. And so although that's inconceivable, that is the reality of the situation. What can the same I about rooms tax, though. Yeah. And finally, yeah, exactly tour, right. So you never know. <laughs> so, so the significance of choice, and and I'm 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 obviously directly speaking to you in this in this room, but I'm also speaking to the lots of people who watch these shows to understand it a little bit better. And so, how did Nosset get into this, anyways? Well, at the very beginning, it's, and I, I see some you know some students that were at the high school with me at, at some juncture. We were dealing with a couple of issues. The middle school, believe it or not, was starting to see an exodus of students to go to Chatham. And Chatham had a choice program, and, and we were concerned that we were losing students who were choosing to step away from our middle school at that time. And then the good news was they were coming back into the high school in the ninth grade. That was some pressure that was put onto the situation. And then some of you probably remember the creation of the, 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 the charter school, the Lighthouse School. And that was putting pressure on the system. And so Nauset at that time felt it had to begin to move back in to offset the loss of students 
by jumping into the choice program. There is, an, <laughs> there is a reason why every high school on Cape Cod participates in school choice. And that reason is to attract a student body that can carry forward a robust academic program for the students in that district. I, just, I was just driving up to Wellfleet for a meeting, and I heard of a neighboring community spending a pretty good amount to advertise to attract kids over the radio. And, and that happens in many of the districts. I'm pleased to tell you that we've never spent a dime on advertising that we think that the word of mouth of our students telling other students is the best evidence to the quality of our program. Over time, we have uh, increased the number. As I told you earlier, we started with four students. And, 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 and as we grew, we grew with choice because we wanted options for our students. One specific example. When I went to Nauset Regional High School the first year, we had six AP tests taken with one AP option. Today, we have 21 AP offerings and almost 700 exams that are taken. There is a robust program that everyone wants to offer to their students in their community, and how can that be accomplished? I can tell you that we have over 200 students that come into the high school, and we have a robust number that comes into the middle school, but since we're talking about the high school project, I can tell you that that's bringing in slightly over $1.1 million in school choice monies. And when I look at that number, depending upon how I want to spend that money, it could, it could fund up to 23 teachers of some nature. Okay? Or I could use that $1.1 in other ways to meet the needs of the program going forward. The other piece about the robust program, and some of the veterans in the room maybe remember this, that when the Ed Reform Act went in place, it banned study halls. Right? Why? So, okay, what, what, what gives here, Mr. Conrad? Well, everybody had a study hall. Some had to. I was just looking at my notes. Some of our seniors were coming late. They had late arrival as seniors and early dismissal as seniors. That all went away with Ed Reform. And what happened was, the question was, what are we going to do with a rising number of students, 850 or 900 kids at that time, was we had to add more courses. These students, instead of sitting in the auditorium with 100 students and one proctor, now needed classes. And that's where we made the move. And thank you to the taxpayers across the board who supported a rich investment into uh, applied arts and fine arts and, and so forth and other academic courses that would, would, would stretch our students going forward. And so that's where the choice started. That's where, how it grew. And that's where it is going forward. And, uh, and I think... The other piece that we're finding out is that I know there are a lot, of, a lot of people who know a lot about Nauset in this room, but again, I'm speaking to lots of people. When we go into other communities, there are lots of people on boards like this who have just moved into the district, who have come from other states and retired, and now this is their, their home. So I'm speaking as much to those people as others who don't really uh, understand the situation. But for us, that robust program is a program that's recognized for its strength. And I can tell you at Nauset Regional High School, we are recognized as a National Blue Ribbon High School, an award across the nation that people recognize for excellence. There are two major awards in, in, in the state of Massachusetts. We have received the Vanguard School of Excellence and the Compass School of Excellence in the state of Massachusetts. We are on a regular basis being ranked by U.S. News and World Report. And you can make it trivial, and, and to me, to make my example here is, I recently was, my daughter works at Mass General, and I, I was there as I was picking her up one weekend. There was a huge sign in the lobby of Mass General of being ranked highly by U.S. News and World Report. So I guess we can be proud of that as well. 
And these, this is a testimony to the efforts that we're doing to give all of our students, but particularly the students in our own district, the opportunity to have that robust program. And that gives you some background with the choice, okay? Tom, can I ask a question? Oh. Is the 1.1 million a net in yes. terms, so it's net but we are in and out? Yeah, we're, we've, we've been using, quite honestly, we've been using that 1.1 to offset the overall cost of the program to the taxpayers, to the, to the communities. Um, but it is net, yeah. Okay, thank you. So at that point, um, we're into this project. I think the only thing I would like to add to this, and it's significant, it might, it might not make a lot of sense to you, but when I talked to Bob Sanborn, and, and, and you know that Bob's building a new uh, a Votech school over in, over in Howitz right now, Bob was telling me the other day, because he was up looking at our autonomous car project, that he waited seven years before he got selected into the program. Seven years. We were told to wait for five years on, 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 on average, and we got chosen in the second year. And we got chosen in the second year because we have great need. And as it's been mentioned here, at that time there were 80 schools in that pool looking at, at getting into the MSBA. They chose 14, I believe, at that time. And that's significant to understand how people in Boston who do this every day, looked at the needs of Nassau Regional High School. And I'll finish by inviting, and I know a number of you have already, I'm inviting you and the people watching, because if you understand it in terms of the need that we have for this project, then I think you can understand the discussion going forward over the next few months. I'm inviting anyone and everyone in our communities to call the high school and get on a tour on Wednesdays. The tours are given on Wednesdays. You call the main office, and you're going to take the one hour walk relative to what the MSBA saw, so that you too have the information to understand the need that we have with this project. Because that's critical. I, I wouldn't invest a dollar if my wife said we're going to do this, this room over, I want to see the room and I want to understand what the problem is before I'm going to commit to doing anything with it. And the numbers that we're talking about are big. And, and I think it's wise of every citizen in the four towns to take that one or two hours to become well versed in, in, the, in the concerns that we have. So I'll stop there. I, I think uh, uh, we'll go into Greg and Greg's going to now take us and catch us up um, where we've been and where we are and uh, what are some of the next steps. So thank you, Greg. Good evening. I'm evening. Greg Lavoster, the chair of the building committee. Um, Chris and the regional school committee, as they said, uh, as you said, voted the building committee in uh, fall of uh, 2017. January 22nd, 2018, the group that was named to that committee met at the high school. We did a, a quick tour of the property uh, so folks get some sense of the size of the property and uh, the spaces involved. Um, and then um, we were asked to have a chairperson and Tom volunteered me, so here I am <laughs> uh, doing this uh, <clears throat> second time around. They did the last building project as well in the 90s. Um, so to reiterate, MSBA is our partner. But MSBA, Mass School Building Authority, besides being a partner, they have a rigid program. They have covered this through every community, every scope, uh, project you can imagine from, you know, half to uh, one, excuse me, $50 million to $250 million. They have scope all over the state. So in doing that, uh, that's one of the reasons why we have a project manager. There's lots of paperwork, lots of deadlines, and lots of targets we have to hit. So part of that process was that with the architect on board, we go through a bunch of scenarios that the Mass Building Authority requires. The first is to take the existing campus and do what's called a code upgrade. You take the buildings, you bring them up to code for handicapped accessibility, heating, ventilating, energy efficiency. That's a huge one for the campus. Um, so that, using the, the existing buildings, um, was a program that we looked at, and that's the first step. 
that was given a price tag of $91 million, but it didn't accomplish a lot of things. Um, when you do with the MSBA, they want a project that's going to last 30 to 40 years uh, because they're investing money. And to our knowledge, no one is, they have never invested in just a code upgrade anywhere in the Commonwealth. Because part of the deal is, as Chris and Tom alluded to, this is a two-pronged approach. When you become one of their partners, you have to do an education plan, which means you have to explain to the Commonwealth and its staff, and their experts in this, what you're going to do for educational opportunities for the kids. And in doing so, that generates a number of spaces. They have a template that's 30 lines long. Um, every classroom has a square footage amount. If you have 905 kids, you're going to need so many classrooms for English, math, that type of thing. And they all have numbers to plug in to get to the bottom line of a project for 905 students of 220,000 square feet. We presently have 183 and change. So we need to add some square footage under this project to make the grade with MSBA. So at the other end of the spectrum with MSBA is a totally new facility. And a totally new facility either on the existing site or someplace else in the district. So um, we contacted all four towns assessing departments asked the four towns if there was a 40-acre parcel in any of the four towns that would be able to be used for a potentially new high school. Um, surprise, surprise, the answer came back. There's no 40 acres that the towns own or anybody else owns that we could purchase for a new high school. So that made it easy for us to concentrate on the site we have here in Northeast Dam. Um, and it's a 72-acre site. It's within the National Park. It has a very special... Um, atmosphere around it and people love the fact that they're out here on Cape Cod close to the ocean you can hear the ocean you can see the lighthouse at night that type of thing so um, that was quickly uh, by the building committee set aside because it was 151 million dollars plus the reason I say plus is because as a, as a building committee of 17 people we didn't want to waste taxpayer money having them chase a project that we probably weren't going to do which is a new high school and probably weren't going to do a code upgrade because we weren't going to chase that either. So that 91 million and the 151 are numbers that aren't that firm. They're kind of soft. Part of the reasons why, and if you look at the packet I we put in front of you with all these wonderful pictures, the third packet in for the new high school, it had a lot of issues. Uh, the first one was that we would have to um, put the buildings on top of your brand new water main for the well that's up in the Cornell High School property. That didn't go over well with Mrs. Beebe or Peter, who um, are on the building committee. Um, we also avoided the new tennis courts that the town of East Dam rebuilt several years ago. Um, we didn't want to tear those up because that was really a not a good idea, a non-starter. That's CPA money. you got to be careful. Yeah. With That's right. Yeah. Um, we also didn't want to tear up the, the football field because that was all <coughs> donated money, about $700,000 for people in the district to rebuild that. So the building kept moving further north on the property. So then, um, lo and behold, we tripped over a little line in the, in the sand type of thing where there's endangered species because it's within the National Park. So that's one of those thresholds that we just weren't going to be able to overcome. Um, so that, that's why that proposal for new high school on the same property went by the wayside. So what we've come up to is, um, so that's one and seven. There are almost ten different variations we looked at through this whole process. Um, over the last 10 months. We finally, uh, back in the spring, settled on what is the middle page of that packet. It's called uh, option 4A. And that's what we submitted to the state as our plan to, to move forward. It's a 60% renovation of the existing property. Um, two buildings get torn down. The science building, which is e-building today, and the cafeteria. The buildings are in the wrong place. They don't meet the needs of the campus moving forward. So it's easier for us to tear those down and build new spaces that fit the need of the MSBA. And again, they have very strict guidelines. Science labs from MSBA are their cookie cutter. Chris and I have visited six schools in Massachusetts, renovations and new. So you can tell them science labs right away. They're 1,200 square feet. There's an uh, ante room where the safety equipment for the chemicals is stored. The ceilings are minimum of 10 feet high because the chemicals in the building in the room have to be taken care of. 
and a very special ventilation system. I mean, it's very technical, very high tech, but it's for the safety of the students and the safety of the staff. So um, there's no way for us to do that in the existing science building because the ceilings are poured concrete and they're only eight feet high. So that was one of the major reasons why we decided this E building has to come down. Also, for those of you who've been on campus, E building has elevations that don't match. It's almost like a split level house and they don't match up with the first floor, they don't match up with the second floor. So connecting all the buildings with E building online still was gonna be a nightmare um, for handicapped accessibility. The cafeteria, when it was first built in uh, late 60s, 69, 70, the high school cafeteria was a basically a place to eat. The kitchen was just a warming kitchen. The food was prepared at the middle school, trucked to the high school and just kept warm for the kids to eat. Um, and, that, and there's no room to expand the kitchen because right next door is the gymnasium. So we need to do something about kitchen eating facilities. So that's another reason why the cafeteria came down, is, is coming down. And it's too small. Uh, there are three or four uh, lunch periods and they start almost 11 o'clock in the morning for lunch and they finish at one o'clock in the afternoon. So it makes for a long day for, and growling stomachs for the kids on the property. So what we have been doing, uh, the education plan went back and forth from last November through almost May of this year. Uh, we file, they have comments, we take care of the comments, it goes back and forth. Um, Mr. Conrad, the high school principal, Mr. Elsasser, and Kathleen Tringali, the teacher in charge of the subcommittee, went up to Boston, made their presentation to MSBA, and it was overwhelmingly accepted and approved uh, for moving forward. The second part of this is what we call the schematic design. And if you look at the little piece of paper I gave you, all the colored lines, um, this is the schedule that we're following as we speak now. And that is we're developing, refining the physical plant requirements of this project. And by that I mean um, when you first file a project as a preliminary schematic design, it's very, very broad. Uh, but you have to start narrowing things down. So we had a meeting last week, uh, the 23rd, with some of the engineers from Boston. We spent well over two hours going over some of the systems. Uh, they have proposals they bring to us, and we say no as owners. We're not interested in things of that nature. Case in point, the first thing they brought us to the table was um, they wanted to, again, put a brand new heating plant, but one heating plant for the whole campus. And that's what we have today, and we said no. We're not interested in that. We want smaller heating plants that are easy to maintain, and you don't have to have um, the campus go offline. If the heating plant fails, you can still run part of the building or still part of the property. So they're going to come back uh, next time and work with us on that type of system. Same thing with the air conditioning. We've been asked to air condition the whole campus. Um, and that's still in the program. We're still working on that. Um, some of that may be eased out at some point, but right now that's what we've been asked to do and that's what we're going to do. Um, that's roughly a million dollars in equipment. Again, we said the same thing. We want multiple systems tailor-made for the, si the spaces that they're cooling off. You don't need the same type of equipment to cool off the gymnasium or the auditorium as you do for a classroom building. It just makes no sense. So, and if you localize it to the building, it's much more energy efficient. There's smaller units, things of that nature. So where we are today is that we're working diligently to move this project forward um, so that we can have a lot of critical votes coming up next month. Um, the first one is because we have to file a submission in December for the preliminary uh, finalized schematic design with MSBA in Boston so that they can read it, bandy about back and forth because next February of 2020, they will take a vote, the preliminary vote from MSBA to fund NASA Regional High School Building Project. And that will be the number we'll be using to go forward for the town meetings next May. Um, it's a very compressed schedule to some folks, but uh, we have time to work and come back to you as much as you want um, and have as many discussions as you'd like. So um, back in June, June of, of this year, 26, we had a meeting with the library in East Ham, which was very well attended. And I thank you again for those folks who came because we presented a potential uh, option for how the project would be managed. Um, and the options are what's called design, bid, build, which is pretty much what everybody is familiar with on Cape Cod. You design it, you put the plans out in the street, people bid on it, and you take the little bidder and you move forward. Um, the architect and project manager have brought forward a request for us to consider construction management at risk, 
which is a different program that's been on the boards roughly eight or nine years. Um, they feel a third set of eyes looking at the plans, helping them do the scheduling, do the phasing, would be something we should look into. The building committee needs to make that vote no later than December 1st, so that that can be put in the packet to submit to Boston. I've asked multiple times, and I'll ask again tonight for any feedback from either one of these groups, what your preference would be. Um, I will share with you that that preference, a, a CMR, construction management at risk, has a premium. $5.9 million would be added to or included in this project for the construction management at risk firm. Um, as I said, we haven't discussed it yet. We did ask the project manager to find us a speaker. Um, there's a gentleman that used to work for the town of Barnesville as their risk manager. He's since retired, so that avenue is uh, cut off to us. Um, so they were going to present their case at a building committee in the future, and I will let everybody in this room know in the other three towns that please you're welcome to attend so you understand the thought process that goes with that vote either for or against it. Um, obviously, the bottom line of this project is tantamount to uh, what we need to consider. We have set <coughs> with the submission back in <coughs> May, the top budget number for this project is $139,375,000. And that's the budget you have in this yellow form right here. That has not changed because we haven't refined the program enough. When we refine the schematic design in the next 60 to 45 to 60 days, that document will be upgraded. The first thing that's going to change are the three line items in the budget document, which is line item 36, 75, and 76. And that has to do with asbestos. Um, those three line items have been reduced to 1.5 million uh, from 2.6 million. So we saved already $1.1 million in asbestos abatement costs because a lot of the asbestos was taken out 20, 20 years ago. Mostly now it's just the original floor tile in a couple of the small areas. So as we work forward, um, the whole goal is to refine the project, refine the cost to move the budget in a downward direction. We cannot spend on this project more than 139 and change because that's what we filed the come off. That's the cap. Um, and we, and the, the net number is what the MSB will pay what's called allowable costs. Chris mentioned 41 million. That bounces back and forth. Um, I will share with you like I did the finance committee that for this project, they put 4% more on the table for, rent for reimbursement because we were renovating. They're trying to encourage towns and schools to renovate buildings rather than just tear everything down and build new. So that's an extra 4% on the table for us, which is a huge uh, plus. So the rest of it is just coming up with uh, the spaces that they will fund and they will support. And again, they have a formula for everything. For the office spaces that we're creating, new sp office spaces for the administration, they pay zero state dollars for office spaces. They don't consider office spaces critical to a school. They want to put the money into classrooms and facilities like that. For moving dirt around the campus, they pay eight cents on a dollar. So they don't like spending a lot of taxpayer money from the rest of the state on moving dirt, which is great because we're not going to move a lot of dirt. We're staying right where we are. Um, and quite frankly, that's the last thing I have to share with you folks is that our architect and project manager are almost giddy uh, with this project because most projects, they spend nine to 11 months just looking at other pieces of property, other sites for the project to be cited. The building committees basically squander, is my word, a year just looking at a different place to put the project. We are so far ahead of most building projects because we made the decision early on that we're staying here, this is gonna be the home, and they can zero in on refining the project and getting um, this, the project we need for the education of the district for moving forward. The last piece is that part of the refining process besides the systems is that um, the administration has been working with the team in Boston over the last month or so. And they, again, they go through this whole list of litany of spaces, offices, classrooms, uh, hallways. And they sit down and go room by room, building by building, and say, do we really need that? Do we really need this? So they have refined those requests downward so that, uh, for instance, um, the high school principal said, you know, 
the first shot we had offices of 120, 120 foot square feet, 180, 175. They made the decision that whatever office, whoever's going to sit in an office someplace on Nasser Reason High School campus, that room is going to be 10 by 12, 120 square feet, that's it. <laughs> Everybody gets treated the same. We don't need a lot of offices. So those um, reductions, that square foot reductions will be brought to the building committee at some point. The building committee will vote on that because it has a price tag. Um, and that's where we're concentrating right now is refining the process, <coughs> refining the number so that um, next year uh, folks can stand up and say this is the best project for the district and the best bang for the buck for the taxpayer, even though it's a huge amount of money. Um, I'm being from Brewster and I hear it a lot. <laughs> we are 46% of the district. Um, but as I explained to somebody yesterday, um, you don't have to panic because the money isn't going to be going back for four years because if we vote this next year, the building won't be done until 2024 and the first bill to the towns won't be till 2025 for, for hitting the tax rate. So you have, everybody has time to see how they're going to pay for this. So um, kind of back up a little bit and ease off. But thank you very much for your time and patience. One question on the, uh, was it CMR? Yep. Uh, I know you have to pay a firm and so forth, but the argument is they, they propose this because they think they can save funds on the building side, or is this, uh, can you elaborate slightly on that? $5 million is, is it $5 million? Is five, yeah, it's $5 million, million. and, uh, the, and how does it look? The, the case that um, we're going to hear, and I've been hearing multiple times, and Chris has heard it as well when we visit other places, is that because we are staying on campus and renovating the existing buildings, and the buildings have to stay, not, the students still have to be in the property. They're looking for another set of eyes to help them do the phasing schedule. Because right now, this project is gonna be under construction for 30 months. If we can knock three, four, five months off the project by having another person come to the table and say, we should do it this way, we should move this, do these buildings first, these buildings next, so it's a matter of opinions as to how the project will move forward. Um, is it worth $5.9 million? I don't know. Um, there is still going to be change orders, and you have to pay for change orders. That's part of the nature you of the business. You don't have to. Well, you're, you're asked to, let's put it that way. Yes, you're right. Okay. You're, um, <laughs> I'm and, learning. And <laughs> as I explained to folks, they're change orders because, <laughs> there are change orders because for the most part, these are all, custom built projects, even though we're using the existing concrete structure, everything that goes inside those is all new. So there's always things that are missed um, and people want, need a change order. And we'll have a discussion about that at our next meeting as well. Yes. Um, is the uh, 5.9 million included in the 139.4? Yes, it is. Everything is so, in that number. So if that's used, then that reduces the amount for something else. Yep. And, and I have a question about the bond issue. Are you going to discuss that this evening or the tenure of the bond issue? So uh, we just met uh, the town managers and the uh, our finance directors in each of the four towns and we're working on that as we speak. We are, uh, my, my directive to both Giovanna and, and Jim in our business department is we want the, the dates and the process locked in so that we can communicate back to our town managers who will share that information with you going forward. But there is, there is clearly an understanding of uh, the funding uh, going forward with the bonds uh, and, and we're beginning to try and get some idea of what people are thinking relative to the 20 year, 25 or 30 year uh, numbers, things like that. So if one town <coughs> wanted 30 and some other town wanted, how does that work? I mean, you're the committee is going to decide and that's it for everybody. Eventually the school committee makes the decision, but we want as much input as we can get from each of the towns. Chris? And just touching base back on the CMR at risk, um, there's a couple points here. First off, the concept is in a remodel, having another set of eyes looking at the job going on, you end up with a better product. So it, it occurs more thoroughly, less money's wasted, less change orders conceptually, uh, but a better project. When you go to the state website and see the buildings that are taking place, you can see who is CMR at risk. 
all the largest projects are CMR at risk. So I don't think these towns are trying to give away their money. It's just, and these are, sadly, but towns that do this a little more often than we do it. They've got 15 schools in their town or whatever. So I'm not pushing it, but we, you can't, <laughs> we don't get, our OPM really doesn't give us information on what way we should go one way or the other. The architect doesn't either because they don't want to be mm. caught in that trap. It's not their role. So there's, we're kind of like in a, <laughs> a ghost of information on it, but it would appear that a lot of places choose that as a way to go. So it is something that should be looked at at least. Chris, Peter. Um, just to add to that, my understanding when it was explained to us was uh, also that um, the CMR at risk uh, system, the builder gets brought in earlier. So the builder ends up being part of the design team uh, through the end of it, uh, whereas a uh, design bid build, uh, the design gets all finished and then you throw it out there. So the idea is there are fewer mistakes, a few change orders, and maybe some time saving. And time saving, it's you know, that sense. could be worth, it's worth money and maybe, it'll, maybe it's close to Time and million. displacing of students. I mean, that's, yeah. that's yeah. going to yeah. be the one, that right? Shared with us is yeah. that, that this could help us plan the placement of students so that it would be the least disruptive option. Not and there was one other, one other point that they made, which is on the Cape, uh, because especially in Northeast Ham, it's so far out that you're not going to get a whole lot of bidders on design, bid, build, um, and you may get a better quality uh, contractor through the uh, CMR uh, at risk. Right, like the library, we had we had two. Yeah. Two. Uh, two construction firms that bid on building the, the new library. That was it. So made it made it the, easy. The good so, news was sorry. Uh, the good news was uh, that apparently in the past there have been some some kind of shady contractors and, are real, and they were a little bitter so they would get the job. But our architect tells us that, and the OPM says most of those guys are, the state is kind of, they're, they're not in the mix anymore, so. That's good. Yeah. Let me just see if the board had any, any questions from our board that you had? I had a couple, just a couple things. Oh, you do? Oh, sorry. Well, actually it was a question I saw from the finance committee, but, uh, when are we going to see a, a, a request to build, rebuild the uh, middle school? How, how old is that? Mm -hmm. It's older. <laughs> Amy, um, if, if I'm just, uh, I have a few questions that come from the FinCom, and that's one of the questions. Right. Um, I, there are nine questions. If you, if, if you don't mind, Jerry, if I just answer those, and, and that's one of the answers we'll be sure. giving you. Okay, does that sound Great. reasonable? Yes. Okay. So um, I'm looking at, thank you, Jerry, for these questions, by the way, and, and uh, it's, it's helpful for the process. So the first question uh, is talking about uh, how do you project future student enrollments? Uh -huh. So I can tell you that last year, uh, at least seven meetings uh, through the collaborative, um, we met with a renowned expert in demographics out of Exeter, New Hampshire. And we were looking collectively as a, uh, the entire group of uh, superintendents on the Cape of what a, what's the research telling us. And obviously there's, and you can say, well, why are the superintendents spending so much time on it? Because there's direct impact on what happens in the, in the future in terms of <clears throat> schools. And uh, quite honestly, um, one of the major reasons why uh, there's such concern about this is of the, uh, the ability to have affordable housing for young families and stay in our communities, right? So I can tell you that from that research, and he warned us to be careful in terms of predictions and, and uh, you know, banking on exactly what information we share with boards like this. But the general consensus was that across the Cape, his prediction would be that we would see a reduction of about 1% of the student population uh, on a yearly basis. Now, he doesn't say it's going to happen in Orleans or East Ham. He doesn't, he doesn't identify where, but he is most concerned about the affordable uh, housing possibilities for young families in, in, in the Cape in general. Okay? 
So I think that that's, um, when, when talking about the predictions, I think it's something we have to watch. Um, the second question really is talking about, you know, the predictions about the new housing facility coming in. We have no data at this point. I don't have any data in my office ident identifying how many students of school age um, or otherwise will be coming into those. But once we know that, we're very, very interested to, to watch that and see what we think is going to be the trend going forward. We're excited uh, in, in the elementary school, particularly, to potentially have more students coming in. And we think that's a good thing. And we have the capacity to do that without adding to the budget. So that's where we stand relative to any predictions on what's happening with that housing project at this point. The third question talks about, would we, with a brand new uh, tech school coming online soon, will we see a higher percentage of students going to the tech school? I'm sure Bob uh, Sambo and the superintendent has, has, has mentioned that Nauset Regional School System is the only system that works with, it, with the technical school. What does that mean? That means that the rest of the districts don't allow them to come into their schools to talk to their students about options. We're talking mainly about eighth graders. Or those school districts don't send their kids to see the tech. We are just the opposite. We absolutely take all of our eighth graders to see the tech and tour it and spend a day. I'm sure Bob gives them a real nice lunch. <laughs> and, and on the flip side, uh, are, they're able to come into our school and sit down and talk. We believe that we're dream makers for our students. And if their dream is to go to the technical <coughs> school, that's where they need to go. <coughs> there should be nothing in the way of that happening. Now, having said that, I can tell you that I see a partnership with the technical school growing quite quickly in terms of uh, a program that we're heavily involved in, we're partners with MIT and, and, and uh, the Viva Works Labs up there and Bob Shen, who heads up all of that operation. We've had three years of summer programming with the autonomous cars and racing them at MIT on a, on a weekend and, and so forth. Uh, drone work, we, uh, we have a drone that has a payload of up to 17 pounds that we've built from scratch and so forth. Bob just went with me to see all of this and he's excited to go up to MIT and see the labs and make these partnerships. So I'm predicting that there will be a joint agreement between a comprehensive high school, Nauset, and a technical school, our Cape Cod Tech program, to share our programs. And I think that's in the best interest of both schools. Bob's excited, I'm excited. That's where I see it going, and I don't see really any great increase of numbers that will go to the, the, the tech from that. Jerry? Certainly if possible. One question on sharing, you know, the shared programs, which I'm absolutely, totally in, in favor of. What does that, does it mean anything vis-a-vis -vis building? You have, let's say we share, a, we share a program with Cape Cod Tech and there's a new facility there and we're contemplating new facilities here, does it change uh, what we might look at at building at Nauset Region, because the Cape Cod Tech is already, you know, that's, that's a done deal, uh, because Cape Cod Tech has it, and we have a joint program, and maybe we don't need this particular yeah. lab at Nauset Region. I, mean, I, I, it's, it's, I it's don't a, know, just asking the it's question. It's an interesting question. I can tell you that uh, it will take time. I'm sorry to tell you that, but it, you know, just the fact of having a partnership with MIT, we worked over a year just for that. And the purpose of this is that Nauset rec recognizes that Bob is, is really moving to an autonomous auto lab setting. There's no question about it. We have invested twelve to $16,000 through donations, autonomous vehicles that our kids are already working on. Um, they literally break them down to scratch and rebuild them and then race them. And when I say race, it's not speed. It's the sonar, the radar, the programming of whether they can pick up a boulder in the middle of the road on the track at the ice rink at MIT. So 
It, and these have been summer programs at this point, and, and they'll continue <coughs> to be summer programs. We've just this year, we've started to break down that autonomous car project into a, a semester long sonar class and, and a radar class and so forth. So we've got a long ways to go, but I think having Bob considering at least looking at it from that perspective, I know it's gonna produce good things. I just, I, I don't think it's gonna happen as fast as maybe you're thinking about, okay? How many students are, at Nauset are from uh, our district? Uh, this gets into choice, this gets into um, uh, tuition agreements and so forth. So I brought with me something that I typically give you when we talk about the budget. Jackie, if you would be kind enough to be the keeper of this information. This has all the information. It's a two-page document that details every piece of the information across the board in all categories in, in our schools, okay? So there you go. <laughs> Nobody new. wants it. I'll lose it. Uh -huh. <laughs> She'll be the new keeper. So, the, <laughs> so, so number five is talking about if there were no school choice students attending Nauset Regional High School, what would be the effect on the budget? And uh, and and let's start with that. This uh, that's a big question, and one that people want to understand. So I took the liberty of let me back up and say that at Nauset Regional High School, a master schedule is built every year. It's not a cookie cutter like this schedule stays the same for 10 years. It stays for one year to meet the needs of the course selections of every student that's going to be going to that school. Okay, so it is a complex process. Knowing that this is a question in all four towns, I took the liberty of taking that master schedule reconfiguring with the help of Robin Walker. Some people remember Robin Walker. She's a, a legend at the high school in many ways. And what we were able to do is we added a column that then analyzed every section that's run at Nauset Regional High School. Now I wanna caution you if you wanna play around with the schedule that you have to understand you cannot just take, Nauset has 950 students Everybody has to take English. I'll divide 950 and come up with how many sections we need. At Nauset, let's just take a, a freshman English program. We have uh, ninth grade honors, we have ninth, ninth grade college prep, and we have 9B for students that we need to help pick up uh, who have fallen behind. So you're dealing with three totally different sections. And so what we did was we took the entire master schedule, it was 657 pages to break down so that we could look at every section and identify how many school choice students are today in that section. Then I had to come up with some number relative to how many sections would we lose and what's the number that we would say we would kick the class out because it's too low. And, and, and the only thing I came up with is the policy that the school committee has that when we open the year, they want to know how many sections are under 10 and how many sections are over 25. So I had consistency. I wasn't just picking a crazy number. So I went with sections that were under 10. I can tell you that after reviewing the information, it's over 80 sections would be cut. And that's, that's significant. Jamie? Well, I guess, and I mean, maybe this is a naive question, but why, I don't think this would impact things because school choice isn't, in, from what I can see, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. It's staying, which is a good thing, I would yeah. think. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I can't imagine this impacting a decision on this. Right. So maybe I'm wrong. No, no, yeah. you, you have you. I like your answer. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the issue is that some people want to know if yeah. we got rid of choice, how bad would the pain be? Mm -hmm. And that I'm, I'm telling you to answer that question, I had to go into this process and identify then, given those parameters, 
and choice went away, what would be the devastation to the, to the program? And that's what I came up with, okay? I'm not, I'm not doing anything other than to say if we pulled that back. Okay. Now, I'll give you an example how it gets complicated. And I just, I just was looking at some foreign language numbers. And in French too, we would, if we got rid of the, the choice program, we would be down to six students. Now, more than likely, we wouldn't run for six students. Now we have a gap between a student who takes French one, who would then logically want to go to French two, into three and four, and it would cause all kinds of chaos in terms of the language question for that student. So I'm just, that's, that's, uh, that's been a question in many of the communities, and I, and I think um, uh, kudos for the work that we did on, on looking at a master schedule at that level. So, Jamie? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I'm just going to, on your uh, 80 sections that would be cut, what were the total number of sections? To uh, around 80 sections. I know, but what's the total out of, what do you... What so that, that would be, what we would be looking at is how many jobs would be lost. Right, and but I'm, I'm just saying, what are the total number of sections? Oh, I, I want to say something around 400 and... and okay, and, and so plus. it almost fits with... 25%? How, yeah. 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 It almost fits with just how many choice students there are. You right. can almost just lop off That's right. that, I, that I many do, uh, options would be... Amy, reduced. can I just make one more point on, on your, building on your point? We cannot build a program on part-time teachers. And that is a problem when we get into the elective areas. And so if we just suddenly decide, you know, we just can't run those two sections, I'm sorry, Mrs. Jones, you're going to have, you're going to go on down to 60%. It's hard to imagine we can build it, build it and keep it going on part-time people. Jamie, you had follow-up. Yep. And yeah, just to follow up, and I mean, some people might not, enjoy that I'm saying this, but I mean, I, you know, I went through the school system. I've seen a lot of these things firsthand. I've seen Robin Walker make the master schedule, and I understand how critical school choice is to students out here. Um, and it's critical to the school system to be able to offer such a variety of coursework. That's why we have such a great school out here. Um, and to cut something like this because of the budget, I think is a serious detriment to this school. Um, and, you know, I, it really is an alarming thought to me that that would even be on the table. So I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah. Just, just to, we ask these questions because we have to look at things, we look at things on the financial side and we, we know, and I think in the beginning of the presentation, uh, Tom, Tom raised here's some of the advantage, the educational advantages for having more students, and you can expand expand the side. That that is one thing. But our view, and we see our role. And I'm Jamie. I just want to. We're not being negative. Our role here is to know how much does it cost to let the citizens of East Ham know that school choice does this positive educational thing for us, but it costs money yeah. and part of the thing we don't know how much it costs we know it brings in a net of 1.1 million but we have no idea if you didn't have school choice how much savings would there be in cost of running the school system for it and you, you just have to know you know that and that just sells sell the citizens that i mean the state giving us five thousand dollars is not nauset regional school systems problem that's a problem that comes from the state but the other thing is particularly bringing it here on the, the school, one of the reasons we had learned was the school was overcrowded. And so, okay, uh, if we didn't have, was it 200 students, would the school be overcrowded? There may be other reasons to build. You may build the school differently. But those are things to think about because the citizens of East Ham and Wellfleet, Orleans, and Brewster are going to pay for this school system and 200 students from towns other than Wellfleet, East Ham, Orleans, and Brewster are going to get advantage of the school system without funding the, the critical uh, call, infrastructure cost of building the school. 
it, which is fine, and that's not an argument with the school system. It's just this is the cost, and the, the citizens of Nauset Regional School System should know, know what it is. School choice does not just bring in $1.1 million to us and we save $1.1 million. It brings in educational pluses, mm -hmm. but it doesn't reduce costs by $1.1 million. It, it, it probably adds costs more than $1.1 million, and we get some offset, which is way too low. But that's why we ask these questions, because we don't know. As the Finance Committee, we have no idea what, what it is, and to try and uh, we, we just want information out there for the citizens. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it's not anything again. Listen, we have a uh, people want to come to Nauset Regional High School, which means that students from the town of East Ham get to go to a high school that people want to attend, mm -hmm. and that's a plus. Makes people want to be. But there's a you know, but, but so so we're not here saying oh just looking at dollars, but we need to know the information so that people can make a rational choice uh, on what it is because this is this is not in and we ask about the the middle school here because we have a tax base that's paying for the water system is paying for Cape Cod Tech is going to pay for Nauset Regional High School and when is that middle school going to I mean, Chris, you just said you had $25 million for repairs, $10 million for the high school. That would mean $15 million for, for, for a middle school, approximately. I mean, you just look at it and stuff. And we have elementary schools. I mean, if you go down the list, we have elementary schools that are empty. And we, we've, we've got this. So we, have to, we, we want to go through and say, what are all the things that are coming through here we're not the experts on education. We have to raise the dollar amounts, and we understand that there are pluses elsewhere, and we, we want to start that dialogue. That's what these questions are for. It's not anything to dump on the superintendent or to dump on the select board or to dump on the, uh, the, the, the Nauset Regional High School or the, or, uh, the school board or, or the uh, East Ham School Board with the elementary school. We just think that we have, uh, we, we want to take a look, is there a, is there a better way? Is this the best way to spend our dollars for educating and giving a great education to our children? And that's what we're looking at and we want to ask these questions and the fact that we, you know, and the building crops it up we because got the too. elementary school. We got Thanks. <laughs> So speaking of the middle school, I think Chris is going to talk a little bit about the uh, next question. Certainly. So let's see. Question five. If there were uh, question six, pardon me. What is the lifespan projection of Nauset Regional Middle School facility? When will the facility require renovation? Well, just to, I'm sorry to get back to the original point. First off, uh, we had that 20 million. We took it down to 15. It, it didn't really work that way, actually, because we also have the um, office, the central office in it. The the Middle school's numbers were roughly in the 7.9 million, I believe. But as I say, I can get you a copy of the, uh, you know, of, of the Habib report. The towns have been giving, I'm sorry, have been assessed money for capital projects in and above the budget for the past, I, I believe, about 10, 10 years? 2006. 2006. Um, and those funds have been used to take care of repair and maintenance at the, um, high school and middle school. At present, the dollar amounts roughly in the $550,000 uh, $550, range done every year. So when the capital asset subcommittee sits down and tries to figure out where that money should be used. Since we determined that the high school was in greater need um, than the middle school, all those funds have been geared towards the middle school. So during the time of this process for the high school, all the 550, predominantly, not all, but most of it, is going to the middle school to address their issues to forestall any future need to remodel it. At some point, I mean, as we all know, all buildings at some point in time are going to need remodeling, and it, it's kind of a piecemeal thing. I was taking a look at it today. I mean, what was built when on that middle school? But in general, it's in better shape. You do, though, have 
issues, their systems are, are older. I mean, you know, the boilers and whatever. And at some point, I mean, there's no lie to you, at some point in time, they're going to have to be addressed. Um, they were not, I don't think I was directly in the Habib report, or I did not see it. I'm, um, so we have worked hard to offset and to try to maintain the, um, the physical structure of the middle school uh, for as long as possible, taking the money that is available and putting it into that rather than putting it to the high school right now. It's that straightforward. We're trying to invest as much to avoid uh, any costs from that middle school going forward once the high school gets online. So moving on to question seven. I'm sorry, was there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I had a question, but yes. you didn't mention or discuss the issue of, of looking into moving some of the students from that middle school. To I think college. that's question that's seven. That's the next one. Eight. No, okay. question eight. We're, eight. Oh, it's seven. We're getting there. We're moving. <laughs> so when the need for renovation of the high school was discussed, was relocating the middle school to Northeastern location discussed? If so, why was it rejected? Um, so that was actually discussed. We actually looked at all sorts of different setups. One would have been to, let's see, push the sixth graders back to the elementary schools, to push the seventh and eighth graders to the high school and not use the middle school uh, any longer. That was one option. One option was putting them all into the high school. Um, looking at that, the regional school committee talked through all the items and, and talked about just the benefits and, and drawbacks from it. Educationally, it is not good to have eighth graders in the high school. And you can look up and down the Cape, they've all done it, but that doesn't make it the right thing. The right thing is ideally that they should be <laughs> separate from the high school. And, and you'll also note that any, many of the new buildings that the state has done that incorporate high schools and middle schools have a separating wall. So they may share a gym and they may share a cafeteria. cafeteria but they share nothing else. So you're part of doing that or planning to do that for our school would require taking it all down and beginning again. I mean, starting with new structure because it doesn't really lay out to that type of, of process or thought. And that was part of the discussion that went on. We spent four, four, months. four months discussing this and, and just trying to figure out what was best for the area and best for the students and it was determined that our current configuration served the needs of the students the best um, for I mean a multitude of reasons but those that was last summer so July August September and October I believe was when those discussions went on um, or it may have been two years ago pardon me let's see and so I mean so the it was rejected not so much it was just thought that our current structure fit our students' needs better. It wasn't that we rejected the concept of doing it. Um, seven, all right, what were there other scenarios considered such as moving grade six grades? We just discussed that. To underutilize schools, um, we did, we discussed all these scenarios. So, I mean, this was part of the topic that came up. Um, one of the issues was is that, you know, the, the elementary schools are not part of the region. They are administered by it, but not, so it would require us to change all of our um, other documents. I mean, it all, we'd have to have a new negotiation agreement. You can't, we couldn't tell them they'd have to take these students. We'd, we'd, it would have to change the regional agreement. So it just, it, again, just didn't, make sense um, the process we felt what we had now that doesn't mean we're not cognitive that there is a population issue and that it's challenging for each of the towns and that we need to have a you know you can see it every morning out on the highway by the stream of cars that are coming from off cape to on cape to do services we don't have younger families that are moving out here because they can't afford it um, I think that that was part of, we had that in our discussion, and it, well, I realized that it is a, an overhanging issue on the school system. Okay. I better give an answer question. Answer question number nine. That's if the building plan is not approved by the town, what's plan B? So, um, it's kind of two, two problems. It goes sure. back to the MSBA guidelines. And, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Thank you. What happens if the pro project is rejected by the towns? Actually, it's a town. Any one of the four towns not voting for it would kill the project so next spring. Mm. So MSB is very clear. If um, one of the district towns votes against the project in the majority, 
The district has 120 days to inform MSBA in Boston that the vote failed and why we thought it failed, and then a plan for how we would deal with the failure of the existing plan. Um, and, all, and that's a very short time frame, within two weeks. Um, they, part two of that paragraph, it's on their website, it's very laid out, very specific, that more than likely the state would say, not original schools have a nice life, you need to resubmit for a statement of interest and start the process all over again, we go to the back of the line and the back of the line for a while because they have invested lots of time, staff, and support for us in Boston and this project. And um, this would be a rejection of their efforts um, to help us as well. Um, plan B would then, okay, um, so I'll lay it on the table. One town says no, the other three towns say yes. So right off the bat, three towns want the project we're presenting. Uh, so then you have to figure out, school committee has to figure out what their next step is. So the only way to move forward is you have to ask for more money because there's no more money to do anything else than what we're doing today with this architect and project manager. $1.3 million will be pretty well used up uh, by the time we're done with this next February, next May. Um, so then you have to ask for more money to do what? And that's gonna be another discussion as to what kind of project you put forward for the four towns. Um, and in the meantime, the buildings aren't getting any younger and the process is being dragged out because we're at the, we're at the end of the lineup in Boston. So the plan B is uh, not very rosy. I will throw one more thing on the table we always forget to do is that um, the Nasset district is unique in Massachusetts. In 2006, I was on the regional school committee and we voted to ask the towns for some money to start a capital improvement program because we realized that every year the budget process was, okay, we might need a teacher, but we also need to repair that part of the system. So we said, we need to separate those two. The buildings need to be taken care of no matter what. So um, the school committee voted, and back then it was $450,000. That's the number I picked out of the air that night. Um, and we've been moving forward for that. And it was one of the major things that impressed MSB when it came down that the taxpayers were willing and wanting to maintain these properties and had done so for all these years that they'd never ever seen anywhere else. So kudos to the taxpayers of this region. Thank you. Did you have a follow-up, Jamie, or? Um, just one more question. Um, Sorry. That's all right. Do you remember? Can you speak up, please? Yeah, I just, speaker. yep. Um, do you remember how many years ago it was that that overhead canopy that connected the cafeteria to, I believe it's the science, science building, collapsed? I'm taking a guess, although I remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> it was a Sunday morning. I got a call it's a weekend. at five in the morning, and we were lucky, yeah. And and that there weren't kids underneath it. It was it was somebody was looking over us. Jimmy, I, I would take a stab at at, at, at looking back at the, the time frame. I would say it's probably 15 years ago, 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and the good news is that from that experience, we reinforced all of the other pillars and things like that. Um, but that was a major, major blow to the campus in terms of, of potentially having a devastating uh, Ill injuries and deaths. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I would have guessed 06 for some reason. Yeah. That stands out in my yeah. mind. Yeah. It was, uh, well. <coughs> That's 13, <coughs> so you're, you're close. Yeah. Amy, can I have just two more points? I know it, but I just no, 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 two last I had a, I had One thing that didn't come up in this meeting, I was a little surprised, is security. I hear about that all the time. And I can tell you that the plan going forward is this, I use the term, but it, it, it makes the point. It will be a lockdown. We will have control of who comes on that campus and who goes off. And when you learn more about uh, 4A and the diagrams and so forth, uh, right from the beginning in terms of controlling the parking in the front of the building so that we don't see the sort of loop roads that right now we have that uh, you can travel uh, all the way around the campuses and things like that. A lot of people are concerned about that going forward and they're very pleased to hear that we're gonna have complete control over the movement. We see the possibility of having uh, gate, gate systems, but handsome and, and attractive gates that are, uh, of, of course, with technology being able to be controlled uh, electronically when we open and close them and things like that. 
The other piece that I would tell you is there's a great deal of discussion by the committee, and it has been for a long time, recognizing that we are spending this sort of money, that we're looking at the fact that uh, for everybody in our communities, continuing to learn is very important at every age, not just at high school age. And we're looking at the possibilities of how this can be a community learning center for all of our citizens, giving everybody the possibility of getting uh, opportunities to take coursework, to participate in activities on the campus, and have a robust uh, program uh, opening up for everybody to get something from that facility. So I'm excited to, to see that move forward because quite honestly, even talking with the MSB when we talk about this ph philosophy, they quickly take you to the size of the auditorium and the size of the gym, and the wild card is how big is the lobby, and that's the community piece. And we can do much better than that. And uh, so uh, a lot of people have loved the idea of that there would be something on that campus for every age group to take advantage of in terms of continuing their learning. And I'm excited to see that happen. So I had a few points and questions. Um, I think initially I was sort of taken aback that you were looking at building a new, you know, or renovating anyway, um, several years ago when this first all started. Um, because we had the new doors and windows and there was a life expectancy of the building. But it's really, I think, become clear kind of like the library when we looked at, at doing that. It's only a difference of $7 million effectively after the grant to do option one or option two. Option one, just bringing what we have up to code, or the option two to, you know, add some new buildings, tear down some that aren't as functional. So I think that's a key point to look at, that it really is short money to, to get something that will last much longer. Um, question, I know you did some upgrades in the science building a few years ago in the labs. Can any of that be used in the new facility or? So two things. One, uh, we did switch out um, a couple of labs. And when we began to realize this is like <laughs> going to be unbelievably difficult to fund this sort of initiative in this entire building, it stopped. Okay. So they're, they're, the vast majority of the labs still in that building are the original okay. labs. Okay. So and anything that we put in there that furniture-wise and so forth going forward, we would put the work in, in, in the new building. Okay, great. Um, par look in, looking at the parking with it out front, how many more, are there, are there more spaces? Okay. Yes. What's, what's the new number on the parking, just out of curiosity? Um, well, actually, there are three parking areas now. There's one in the front uh, between Cable Road and the, what's going to be the new front of the campus. The existing parking will still be on the east side mm -hmm. of the property. There will be another parking area in the back behind the gymnasium for uh, athletic events. So um, yep. there, there's going to be an increase of over 250 parking areas um, because right now the school is under, undersized. I mean, those, stuck in my mind, one of the architects who looked at the plants back to me, he said, this is all the parking you have. We said, yeah, there's a lot of grass people park on yeah. because um, this is how it is. We didn't want to pay Well, for them. events and things. Yeah. yeah. So one thing I know we had been talking, you know, throughout the years with the seashore about adding parking for their beaches. And I, you know, just briefly talked to the new superintendent about how about across from the high school? It's flat over there. You know, the trees aren't that old. It's already kind of on a corner. It's a disturbed area to begin with. So that might be something to look into because they're not using it during the school year that much. It's more in the summer when you're not. So as far as adding additional parking, might be something to, to consider working with them about and it'd be, you know, it'd benefit both. Uh, through the chair, you know, the conversation was actually reversed. We were looking at offering them the high school parking lot in the summertime. <laughs> <laughs> Because we would like to get the citizens on the campus yeah. who are visiting the area who don't know anything about the high school. Well, but I mean for sporting events, yeah. for, you know, yeah, yeah. things yeah. at the Performing Arts Center, to have that overflow town meeting. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have people yeah. parked. Everywhere. You know, we've yeah. had yeah. Up, close to 1,500 people at town meeting. 
and they were parked. I live a mile away, like almost. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So it's you know, it's yeah. yeah. So Thank just you. something uh, maybe to think about. Um, lead certification. Yep. What's the goal? The goal is lead. Well, actually, the the Commonwealth and that code upgrade I talked about from SBA. Um, the buildings will be at not lead gold, but lead certified. Um, there's a bump up for lead gold. We don't know if it's worth spending that kind of money, but we're right now, um, actually we get two more points for reimbursement for going for lead certified. Right, we, I went through the library building so, and. Um, it, it, that's part of the plan. And, and we're probably one of the last projects that's gonna get the 2% bump up because MSB is saying, you know, it's part of the new code from Massachusetts anyway, so we're yeah. just gonna say you have to do that anyway. We're not gonna be extra money for for, for just the basic, but the gold, yeah. We, we hit the gold without actually trying that hard, which was pretty good. We were really close to platinum, actually, and, but that would have been, you know, oh, more money. In, indoor showers. Yeah, right, we would have had to have put showers. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Um, and my final question is, uh, I know there's been talk about Truro and Provincetown joining the region. Yeah. Any chance we could get them to do that before and then they could help? Uh... A years. <laughs> so oh. we, just, uh, we just negotiated contracts with both Truro and, and Provincetown this past spring. For and, tuition. Uh, tuition, the tuition amounts and so forth. I will say this for a number of people who look at these sort of numbers. I want to caution you that when you see what the new agreement is from a dollar standpoint, you have to read the fine print of that, that deal to understand that they are paying, both communities pay for all of their transportation costs. Mm -hmm. For the day program, they, they run their own buses. There is a significant cost in transportation. And likewise, relative to special ed services um, that, that would change while they're at our high school, they're on the hook to pay for that as well. So just like a word of caution that when you see 18,000 some odd dollars, you've got to figure in a number for the transportation and special education that it saves the district. And uh, in that conversation um, over months, we, at least Chris, actually Chris was on the committee and, and John O'Reilly, we wanted to enter into some possibility of having conversation about this topic going forward. We knew going into it that in years past, it was a deal breaker. It wasn't to be on the table. It got on the table and one meeting has already taken place. So that's the sort of discussion that I, that I lead you to from that conversation I had with you, all the superintendents understanding demographics going forward and how do we help each other in the future. Um, it will take time and uh, it, it will not be happening in the near future. But it's, it's just the fact that we would have conversation about it going forward is a good thing for everyone. So thank you, Amy. Great. Thank you. Uh, let me take Mary first, Russ, and then I'll get to you. Um, my question is, um, we haven't discussed solar. Uh, how is solar energy going to be included in this project? There, right now there's some solar panels on Amber. They'll, they'll stay. We are looking at a different um, addition of solar panels. We're not sure about the roofs. But uh, the carport areas, you know, the stanchions over the car of the parking areas. Um, and we're also looking at solar hot water for some of the applications as well. Um, it's all going to be put towards the lead certification of the project mm -hmm. and the property. Um, and we'll move forward with that. But it, it's all part of the consideration of the facility we have moving forward. Right, anybody else on the board or the FinCom? All right, Russ, if you come up. I've got a couple questions and maybe a comment. Uh, first, on the on the cost on the option two, uh, which certainly looks to be the better of them, uh, does that include the finance financing cost, that 139.4 million? No. Or, okay, so that's additional. Uh, secondly, uh, Tom uh, is the uh, baccalaureate program showing any potential increase of choice students coming into the school at this point in time? Uh, we're talking about the International Baccalaureate Program, and uh, I'm pleased, uh, you've heard me probably speak on this before, but we were uh, invited into the program about a year and a half ago, 
Uh, we, 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 and, and that's what I'm talking about in terms of a robust program that our students who, who don't find uh, the AP program all that in, exciting has a totally different option with the International Baccalaureate program. And, and it didn't cost us a dollar more. We just reallocated our teachers into different teaching roles for us. We didn't add staff because of that. And so we're now in the second year of that, uh, Russ, and, and we saw a 300% increase in the numbers of kids who wanted that program on campus. And so we know probably as early as next year we might begin that, that, that process, but we want to be very, very comfortable with how we operate that program and we're still in our second year. So there will be, and what Russ is alluding to is if you're familiar with the Sturgis schools in, 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 uh, in Hyannis, uh, their, their sole program is the International Baccalaureate program. We know um, by, by uh, data provided by Sturgis that over 300 students on the Cape could not get International Baccalaureate. And we saw that as a, a, a possibility of having X amount of students who are still looking for yet more and considering NOSET. Now remember, we control that number every year in terms of how many choice kids come in. An example is this past year, we only opened the doors to sixth grade and ninth grade. No, nobody else in the other grades could then enter into our school this past year. So yeah, I think it's gonna be a real bonus for us and, and help us a great deal. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to make another comment and that is uh, on the school choice. Uh, I think it, it ends up, it's kind of a zero sum game. You either keep a student in your community or you don't. And every other school system seems to be advertising to bring them in. So on a general basis, they think it's good. On a specific basis, it allows a school like Nauset to offer additional programs because of those students. And uh, I just think that anything that we can do with the school, whether it's put a new facility in here, or to keep increasing these programs, doing the programs with MIT and, and, and AI uh, are going to allow us not to have to advertise. People will want to come here, and I, I think it's going really well. I'm doing a great job in the school system. Thanks, Russ. All right, anyone else? No? Thank you very much Thank for you coming. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right.